you about state fairs and county fairs, and I'm not really going to talk about that. I just want to share my fair stories. Um, I actually grew up in Minnesota, and so we have the world's finest state fair in Minnesota. That, at least that's what they think. And um, we went to the fair every summer, and uh, when I was a kid, they served uh, uh, the corn dogs and cotton candy, and now they're serving, uh, I think it's bacon, uh, wrapped in ice cream, dipped in chocolate, and then deep fried. So the food stuff just gets crazier and crazier. But what I learned in growing up in Minnesota is that the fairs are really an incredible opportunity to bring people together to really um, celebrate the spirit of the community, and it's also really great for uh, economic uh, development. Uh, at least it is in Minnesota, and I think that's true here. And then for me, the other um, area that I've been connected to fairs is that my niece and nephew grew up on a ranch in Montana. They actually went to a one-room schoolhouse. I don't think there's many kids doing that these days. But for them, their local county fair was really critical to enable them to go to college because they'd raise a steer or a hog or whatever it was. I think Jessica raised sheep sometime. And they auctioned them off at the county fair. And that, that money went into their college account. I'm pleased to say Jessica is uh, almost through college and we're going to get Justin through. I think it's going to take him a couple more years. But um, the fairs was, were critical to my niece and nephew being able to go to college. So I get that much. Um, so the other thing I wanted to t share with you today is that I, I think your work is extremely important. Um, that you really contribute to making Oregon a better place to live, work, and play. I think our rural-urban um, divide can help me overcome uh, with the great work you're doing in county fairs. And I was just teasing some of the folks in the back because uh, the county fairs are spread out pretty well throughout the summer so that elected officials can spend their entire summer uh, going to county fairs. So it's a highlight of my summer, let me tell you. I've just tried to stay away from the corn dogs. So what Kelly asked me to do was share a little bit about uh, my work around leadership training. And um, suffice to say, having served in the Oregon legislature for 17 years and as your Secretary of State, I've been to every single leadership training that they make available for elected officials across the country. Um, so you would think I would have a great idea of what leadership looks like uh, when I see it. Um, so I actually think I do, so I wanted to share with you some lessons that I've learned around leadership, and I hope they can be helpful to you moving forward as you're doing great work in your communities throughout the state. So I just wanted to share that my view of leadership has really changed over time. I used to think of leadership as a person, uh, a John F. Kennedy or a Ronald Reagan. Uh, was my view of leadership, a knight in shining armor who had answers to all of our problems. And um, they had a vision, and they connected their vision with the public, and then we all lived happily ever after. Well, I, in my older age, I have a different view of leadership, and I don't think it's a particular person or a particular role model that I might have. Um, I think it's actually a verb. Think about that for a second. Leadership is a verb, and it's an exercise. I think it's improv, it's art, and it's not science. It's responsive, and it's reactive, and it's continually assessing. So I think this approach to leadership does a couple of things. It enables anyone to participate in the exercise of leadership, depending upon your particular circumstances. And it puts the mantle of exercising leadership on all of us. So I think it results in greater responsibility in our communities. And uh, I like to think of leadership as a muscle uh, that you have to use for atrophies. And speaking of atrophying muscles, I think after spending uh, many cardiac hours in the car yesterday and the day before, I've got a lot of muscles that are atrophied. So 
think of leadership as a muscle, so you have to use it. Um, and then my second premise is that in Oregon, uh, we tend to tackle leadership or uh, difficult issues facing our communities. We tend to tackle them with what I call technical solutions. And this is actually true everywhere, not only in Oregon, but across the states. And the reason is really simple. Um, it's really hard work to tackle our community problems. And it's easier for us to ignore the problem altogether or use solutions that we know are tried and true. The other approach to problem solving is what we call, what I call, adaptive work. So you don't have to take out your pens or your pencils right now. But this is the learning required to address conflicts in the values people hold and the realities that we face. So I think a really great uh, example of relying on technical solutions to face community or statewide problems is the seesaw efforts that have been going back and forth in Oregon probably since the 1980s, probably since before that, uh, to manage our forests. This is right now, I think, a never-ending uh, cycle of legislative or congressional technical fixes that are inevitably followed by what? Litigation from the environmental community. The other way to approach problem solving is through what I mentioned, adaptive work. And um, what I think is a great example of adaptive work, what I've seen from around the state, I think there's a lot of examples. But uh, my uh, husband uh, was working in uh, on the Malau Whitman National Forest when we met. And uh, I got to know folks over at the Malau Resources Institute. Anybody here from Malau County today? Tammy, yay, <laughs> Tammy, Tammy's here. Um, Malau Resources Institute has created a really incredible national model of natural resources stewardship and rural job creation. The folks in that community are using their natural resources to create a stable and arguably growing account economy. So in the private sector, adaptive versus technical leadership uh, looks like Microsoft versus Apple. Okay, how many people in the room are Microsoft people? How many people are Apple people? How many people are not computer people? <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So um, Microsoft and Apple are probably the best examples I can give of adaptive versus technical work. Microsoft is technical. More, better, faster. What did Apple do? What did Steve Jobs at Apple do? Anybody use uh, uh, iPod, iTunes? I use those. No, nobody uses those. <laughs> Somebody uses them. How about your children? Tammy uses them. Children, grandchildren, um, iTunes, iPod, iPad. They literally changed the way we connect to our computing system. And uh, I think the children growing up today who are. Uh, uh, technology natives would totally completely agree with that. So uh, adaptive work looks like Apple, technical work looks like Microsoft. So with all apologies to uh, guys up in Seattle. So um, that's kind of what I see big picture. Let me share a couple of lessons that I've learned uh, about leadership in my many, many years uh, in Oregon politics. And uh, I think these are pretty useful strategies for surviving the challenges of leadership. So uh, from my perspective, uh, the first strategy to successful leadership is being able to work collaboratively. And um, there are a number of circumstances I think when collaboration can be really, really useful uh, for problem solving. But I think one of the problems about collaboration is that you're taking a risk because you don't necessarily know that you are going to uh, work until you actually do it. So collaboration is really important. And Kelly remembers this, Tammy remembers this, from the 2011 legislative session, you all might recall uh, 
the State House in Oregon was tied for the first time ever in Oregon history. We had 30 Democrats and we had 30 Republicans. Holy smokes. I thought it was going to be a disaster. Um, but after a series of negotiations, they developed a situation to actually share power between the Republicans and the Democrats. And the reason why I thought this was going to be particularly challenging is because the House is a very inexperienced and tends to be a very partisan body. So I didn't think the power share would be very successful. But uh, they did some pretty amazing things that legislative session. Um, the leadership of the House passed a budget, a balanced budget, despite the fact that they had a $3.5 billion deficit. They passed structural changes to our education system, and they passed both a legislative and a federal redistricting plan that uh, didn't draw any legal changes. That had not happened in Oregon since before I was born. So that's pretty amazing. And it's really amazing uh, when you look at what happened in your state capital when you compare what happens in the federal capital right now. So I think as I look back at that time, that moment in what is now Oregon history, there were some reasons why the power sharing arrangement was extremely successful. So two co-leaders, two great speakers, Bruce Hanna, I know we've got some folks from Douglas County here in the room. Bruce Hanna uh, partnered with Arnie Rowland uh, from Coos County, and they absolutely did an amazing job that session. They were um, extremely committed to the legislature as an institution and uh, to the people of Oregon, and they put their commitment to the people of Oregon and to the state capital as a priority over their politics. The other thing is, Arnie and uh, Bruce were willing to share the credit, and that's really, really important. And um, I would also argue that the power sharing had an opportunity for each one of those 60 state representatives to have their voice be heard in the process. So, power sharing, collaboration, we know it worked at least once in the Oregon House. I just want to share what we did in my office uh, in a very successfully uh, in terms of a public-private partnership. I know that uh, at least state dollars are very, very scarce. I think that county resources are very scarce as well. And I think one of the ways we can make our taxpayer dollars go further is through public-private partnerships. And we were able to partner with a small firm in Baker City. Anybody here from Baker County? Yay. Do you know Richard and Kathleen Chaps? No? Yes, you do. Okay, all right. Well, we partnered with Richard and Kathleen uh, to provide some really wonderful technical services. It's actually called our electronic records management system, called TRIM. We couldn't do it in the Secretary of State's office on our own. Um, and we didn't, we didn't have the staff the infrastructure. And the JAFs have the technical knowledge and they have essentially the cloud system in a 100-year-old historical <coughs> building in Baker City. So it's pretty cool. We had different strengths that we brought to the table, uh, making it a really wonderful, ideal situation for a wonderful collaboration. So, in short, the project allowed us to offer our software, which is known as TRIM, and no, it's not an exercise program for librarians, as a service to other state agencies and uh, to local governments. So working with JAPS, we're able to make this project available to local jurisdictions as well in a very affordable way. The other good news about this wonderful public-private partnership is that uh, as a result of this partnership, We've been able to put over 25 people to work in Baker County. When we're fully implemented, and we'll hope to put up about 100 people to work in Baker County. And I know for those of you, at least for me living in Portland, 100 people, 100 jobs may not sound like a lot, but obviously to those families, it's really, really important. And for every 20 to 25 jobs we can create in rural communities, it's like 2,500 jobs in the metropolitan area. So that's really great news. So collaboration, really wonderful to
to a wall. All right, second strategy. This is what I call pushing the work down, uh, which is essentially you taking the work off your shoulders and putting it back to where it belongs. Uh, has anyone in this room ever helped a son or a daughter with their homework? <laughs> okay. Has anyone actually ended up doing the homework instead of letting your son or daughter do it? I want to see hands. Yes, I see a few hands. Why do you help out your son or your daughter? It's easier, right? Yep. Why do you do it? You want to help them, right? But does it really help them learn when you do the homework? No, but it certainly reduces your tension, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I, my stepdaughter went to, and she did her math degree at Portland State University. I couldn't help her after about eighth grade in math. So anyway, that was lucky in our, house, our, in our household. So that's what I call pushing the work down. Um, it's really much easier to do the work sometimes than to let the uh, daughter or grandchild uh, struggle and tackle the problems on their, on their own. Uh, what about in the workplace environment? Has anybody here ever done work that a coworker was supposed to do? Yes. <laughs> How did it make you feel? Tired. Tired, okay. Why did you do it? Did they show up for work? Uh, no. Oh, no. Okay. All right. Well, then sometimes you just got to do it. But did your coworker learn from you having to do the work? I don't think so. Yes. No, I don't think so. So that's a great example of, and maybe the circumstances didn't allow you to push the work down. But I just had this all happen in my office this week. I've had a couple of crazy weeks where I've been working on weekends and working, uh, well, like in this job, you can work all day long and never finish it, just like your jobs as well. But uh, I had a crazy week, and I had a speech I was giving last night, and I didn't have time to finish the speech. And so I got up at 4 a.m. yesterday morning to finish drafting the speech. Guess what? Do you think the Secretary of State has a communications director? Yes, she does. Is the communications director responsible for speech writing? Yes, he is. And that was an example of where I should have pushed the work down and had my speechwriter get up at 4 a.m. and do the work instead of me getting up at 4 a.m. to do the work. So a really great example. Um, it's easier said than done. That's for sure. So um, that's the second uh, strategy, pushing the work down. And I know for those of you living in rural communities, I gave this talk over in Baker a few months ago. And somebody asked me, what happens if there's nobody else to push the work down to? <laughs> Guess what? Then you got to do it. So that's the reality. But I think, I, I know in more rural communities, people wear different hats. Sometimes uh, your mayor is also the, uh, uh, serves on the volunteer uh, fire department and also uh, sits on the school board and probably is taking care of three foster children at the same time, right? Uh, so, I know you all are used to working together, and that's really, really important, but uh, at some point, you can't do it all. you got to have other people there to help you out. So, push the work down. Um, last strategy I wanted to share with you is um, a more challenging strategy, but I found it very useful um, in my work uh, in the Senate and as your Secretary of State. And this is called watching from the balcony. So the only way I've been able to describe this very well in non-political or legal terms is, has anybody here ever been to, when you were in high school, did you ever go to a high school dance? A few people? You guys all went to dances. I know you went to dances. It's so long ago you forgot. Okay, all right. Well, <laughs> I can't touch that one. about watching from, watching from the balcony. Um, when you go to a high school dance, if you can remember that back that far, there used to be a lot of kids dancing on the floor. Um, I think they now call them mosh pits. Somebody might be able to help me out with the terminology. But all the kids dancing in the middle of the floor having a great time. If you were to be on the floor and you got really thirsty from your jitterbugging or your uh, country swing, can you still jitterbug? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely, okay, all right. Uh, 
uh, Jitter Buddy, Buddy, or Country Swing. You go take a break, and uh, in my gym, uh, we had a balcony. And you could go up and get water up uh, in the balcony and look down on the floor. And you could see a bunch of kids dancing, whatever dancing they were doing. But there were also a lot of other kids doing other things. Hanging out on the sides, doing things probably they weren't supposed to be doing, goofing around, right? And there were probably kids in the back, uh, kids going outside. We just quit the smoking when I was in high school, you know, just smoking outside, doing all that stuff. But from the balcony, you had a really different perspective than you did from the middle of the dance floor, right? You could see all the different kids doing different things. And the back, that's the best illustration I can give you of watching from the balcony. So right now, if somebody could look down and they'd say, oh, he's really listening to what Secretary Brown is saying, and he's uh, uh, doing a camera, and uh, well, she's about ready to take a nap because she just drove 500 miles yesterday. But it gives you a very different perspective than when you're in the middle of the conversation. And so I use watching from the balcony when I want to get a sense of what's happening in a room. Whether I'm negotiating a budget deal or whether I'm working with staff, I try and stop and sit back and watch and see who's participating and who isn't. Who's providing very wonderful insights, and this is a huge problem now, and who's texting on their phone. So for me, and I know that happens all the time, it's very frustrating, I don't know what we're going to do about it, but for me it's a really wonderful tool to really take a look at a group dynamic and see how well we're functioning as a team. It's really useful if you're, anybody here on a city council? Yeah. It's a really wonderful tool to sit back and kind of watch what's going on in your city council. Sometimes it works really, really well, right? Sometimes in some city councils it doesn't work so well. We've had some really interesting and challenging experiences here in Multnomah County over the last few years. So that's what I call watching from the balcony. Who here in this room is an introvert? I think I am. You, I, don't, I don't think you are. I don't think you are. <laughs> well, I'm guessing mostly when I ask that question, the introverts don't, they don't raise their hands, right? So I don't know if they're, I don't think everybody in this room is an introvert. Watching from the balcony is a harder lesson for extroverts, right? Because we, what, what do we like to do? We like to watch you. Oh no, we like to talk. We like to talk. <laughs> so it's a more challenging uh, uh, lesson, I think, for people who are chatty, chatty cappies. And I'm, of course, one of those. So those are my three leadership techniques watching from the balcony. Uh, the second, of course, is collaboration. And the third, is uh, pushing the work down to where it belongs. And so I encourage you to use these strategies as you tackle issues in your communities and exercise uh, your leadership muscles, like your dancing muscles they maybe haven't used in a while, but if you don't use them, they're gonna atrophy. So thank you very much. It's just been an honor to be here with you today. I'm happy to take questions and talk about the work we're doing in the Secretary of State's office, or I'm happy to talk to you about my little stinker pony that I ride about three or four days a week. He's a really a stinker. <laughs> As only ponies can be. They're like, no, we don't have any questions. We're all introverts. <laughs> Go ahead, Kelly. Long period of time 
Um, our primary businesses that we rely on computers for is our corporation division, which is our business registry, and it's really the first place in Oregon that businesses come to. So it was a huge challenge. And then the other business that we had that really was technology reliant <coughs> is our campaign finance reporting system. And it's campaign season. And so candidates couldn't report their contributions and expenditures, uh, and neither could ballot measures at the time. So huge challenge. Um, we had to take our systems offline for that period of time because we had to fully investigate the extent of the criminal activity. And we essentially had to rebuild our technology infrastructure, and we had to rebuild it so it was stronger, so the bad guys couldn't get back in again. The good news was that we had a safety uh, security plan in place, and we followed our security plan. And the second thing I would say is that the state has a security enterprise officer, and he and his uh, fellow worked with us very, very closely, and they were very good and extremely helpful. Um, the bad news is we haven't been able to uh, find out who did it. We're working with the FBI and the Oregon State Police. We'll continue to work on that investigation. But just to share, this is going to be a challenge for governments moving forward. In the corporation division, all of our business registry, we used to be able to do it, uh, we did it all on paper, and then we built it on electronically on top of that. So we were essentially able to go back in time and provide services to business owners via telephone, email, and fax. Who uses fax anymore? Delaware <laughs> County. Okay. We <laughs> You guys all use fax, don't you? Yeah. Well, we've kind of moved past fax, but I'll tell you, as soon as our website went down, uh, faxing became our very, very best friend. So that's what we did. Um, so just to give you a sense of the phone calls and the communications, we normally get about 75 emails a day. We got 750 emails a day during the website outage. That's a lot of emails. And phone calls, we get about 500 a day. That went up to 1,100 a day. Corporation staff work their little, um, uh, can I say, patooties off, patooties off uh, to make sure that our customers got served. On the campaign side, we were totally shut down. We couldn't provide service. But as soon as we got our systems up and running, we gave people a two-week grace period to get reported, and everybody got it on time. So um, hopefully this will not happen again. Uh, we want to feel like we're fully prepared and not vulnerable. But the reality is uh, this type of criminal activity will continue. We're going to have to be more vigilant. We're probably going to have to, as a state and local governments as well, spend more resources to fortify our technology. But Somebody say to me, technology is really great when it works. Yeah. And when it doesn't, the pain. So. I also want to encourage, any other questions? I'll, I'll just make one more comment because uh, May 20th is coming up soon, and I saw more lawn signs uh, coming into Columbia County. Holy smokes. There must be the hottest contested election for judge. I've never seen such a hotly contested election for judge here. But ballots, uh, if you didn't get them before you left your home, ballots will be out uh, tonight. They'll be there when you get home. So I really encourage you to return them. Fill them out. Return them as quickly, quickly as possible. Candidates call you uh, when your ballot isn't returned. When you get your ballot returned to your local elections office, your name comes off the list, and they will quit calling you. So that's my present to you. <laughs> So, May 20th, uh, 8 p.m. is the deadline. Any other comments or questions? Like, no. We want to go play with our scary stuff. Okay. Thank you very much.